hearts for you. We prepare our hearts for you. Prepare our hearts for you. Prepare our hearts for you. What a shame it would be to sit through all of the things we've already done, the singing, heard some great announcements, waited a bit in his presence, only to still have a heart that has not been prepared for him. What a shame that would be. What a, even a travesty to get up out your bed drive to this building no matter how long it took you to get here get your coffee, get your tea, get your water whatever, come and find a seat and to sit down and to hear the songs or to stand and to sing the songs to hear the preacher, to give a couple daps and a couple hugs, all with an unprepared heart why is that so necessary Sonny, you may ask family the simplest way I can put it to us is God is not interested in anything else. I need that to sink in for a minute. Just for a minute. God is not interested in anything else. He's not impressed with our cool building, with the exposed brick and the greenery, the wooden floors. He not, he's not impressed with our fancy clothes. He's not impressed with our cool marketing. He's not impressed with how good we can sing, hoop, and holler. He's in the business really of one thing and one thing only. What's going on on the inside of us? Because that is what will determine everything else. And that is the assignment that I have, the assignment that you have. You have a responsibility sitting here right now. It's not just on me. Let me say that again. Oh, listen, I thank God for those who labor in the scriptures. Bible tells us how can they hear without a preacher. Thank God for those who have the responsibility of communicating the word of God. Amen. But you do not come in here without a responsibility as well. And it doesn't just start when you're coming in here, right? So we both have a job to do as we consider who God is in our lives. As we truly consider that. As we think about what it means to follow him. What it means to be a disciple. What it means to be a part of the church. If, have you ever looked at the church, looked at us and be like, okay, this is cool, but is this it? Is there more? At Detroit Church, have you ever gotten to a point like, this is great, I love the church, I love the people, but is there anything else, God, is there something else that you're after with me? Have you ever felt like there was something that was missing, maybe a missing ingredient? in your personal life, but also when we come together and I sit with that this morning, I sit with that this morning. I have the responsibility as well, not just to communicate the scriptures, but like you, to examine my heart. Examine my heart. Why? Why? Man, I, I wanna encourage you to get like a three-year-old toddler <laughs> when it comes to your walk with God and in, in, in seeking him. David said, I inquire in his temple. And sometimes I think there's a, there's a lot of beauty. God can meet us in that desperate question of why. Now, it's not a rebellious why. Why, God? No, 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 no. It is a father. Ah, I, I need to check my own heart. So I'm asking myself, why am I here? I remember having conversations with my sons, one in particular. As a teenager, he wanted to get tattoos, you know, earrings and such. And um, we're riding in the car on the way to school. And I said, son, I, I don't have a problem with those things. I have one problem, potentially one problem only. You have to ask yourself the question, why? Why do you want to do these things? In other words, what is the motivation behind it? 
Are you trying to seek for something that you feel is missing? Or is this just an, an artistic expression of freedom and your own personality? Like they're, you know, we're not against those things, but we are against motivations that are self-seeking. Motivations that start and stop with us. And so many times we can do the right things with the wrong motivations. You could be sitting here on the front row with the wrong heart. Now y'all look like y'all got the right heart, so I'm not, you know, I'm not picking on y'all. <laughs> but you on the front row, you might get picked on a little. Maybe I should pick on some people back here. I don't know. <laughs> uh, play nice today. This is, this is serious. I could very easily walk you through Mark chapter 4, 1 through 20. Present the big idea. Present the questions that we see come out of this text. Break it down, line up on line, precept upon precept. And precept. We may do some of that this morning, but family, if I can be real with you, I feel this tugging in my spirit. That in a way, in a way maybe is the the manifestation or the, the immediate expression of the same thing that Jesus is dealing with in this passage. What are you saying, Sonny? We are at a fork in the road in Mark. We're at a fork in the road. Mark has been helping us understand who he is. Yo, he's him. He's the one who he is, who he says he is. He has authority over demonic activity, demonic powers. He is dismantling the kingdom of darkness. So much so that it's, it's causing those who, who appear to be on the inside, the religious scribes, they, they accuse him of being in the wrong camp. They accuse him of being a part of Satan's team. And they say the only reason he has the authority to cast out demons is because he has a demon. He's working for Satan. The blasphemy. Even his whole family is wrestling with his identity and who he is. And they have to ask them, themselves, who do I really believe he is? So Mark gives us this, this idea of Jesus on the scene, loving, healing, meeting people where they're at, spending time with them. They're at his very doorstep. We believe common consensus is he made his headquarters at the home of, of, of Peter and the crowd the whole city has gathered at the doorstep so far in Mark we see the crowds gathering and Jesus spending time with them Jesus welcoming them but something is shifting right now because we can see Jesus welcoming them and we, if we face this passage without a clear background of what is happening in the hearts and minds of, of this original audience, we can bring our 21st century Detroit mindset to this, and we can say, oh, Jesus is blowing up. Well, about time. He's a, he's a healer. Amen. This is great. This is wonderful. But what Jesus does in this moment blows my mind. It blows our minds and it gives us a glimpse of his motivation it helps us understand he was never interested in the crowds he was never interested in winning over the people becoming popular or having great things said about him those things didn't matter to him what mattered to him then we're going to see it so I, I, pray for me, please. And it's not just me. I know that there are others, leaders in our congregation. And if you're the first time, if you're a first time visitor here, what up, though? Welcome. Uh, my name is Sonny, one of the pastors here at Detroit Church. Blessed to serve among some phenomenal leaders. We embrace a shared leadership model. And I really love what God is doing here. Let me just acknowledge that. But at the same time, I, I cannot be comfortable, and I'm not comfortable. I'm actually quite irritated. <laughs> Have you ever been irritated? In your faith walk, I'm not just talking about, you know, somebody getting your nerves. 
maybe irritated with God, maybe irritated with God's people, irritated with what you're seeing in the church, irritated because you're not seeing the results that you think you should be seeing by now because you've spent time praying and fasting. You've done all the things they told you to do. And things don't, still don't seem to be lining up and there's something that's, that's like not settled in you. Something's not right. And if we're not careful, that can even get into a space what the scriptures call a deferred hope. A sick heart. Even, God forbid, bitterness. And this bitterness can go down deep. And when it sprouts up, it roots up, it defiles, it impacts everyone around us. So maybe something that could have started off as a, a holy motivation, if not properly attended to with the right perspective in the, light, the right lens, it could turn into something very dangerous. And I, I pray that even in my expectation for what God wants to do with Detroit Church, that it stays pure and holy. So I have to keep at praying in prayer. Father, purify me. Purify my intentions. God, help me to see things as you see them. Help me not continue to, to play the, the race, to run the, the race of what popular or successful church looks like. Because 9.9.999% out of 10, so to speak, oh, you get the point. <laughs> It's normally what we want and what God wants is normally not, usually not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And many times we're praying, God do this, God do that. And God's like, that. that's never what I was after in the first place. So who must change? Who must change? You know, there are things along this walk that we experience that if we're not careful can become very comfortable crutches for us, including the, the safety and the comfortability of a building. Or, get this, even being mobile. We have our setup teams. We got, we got an agreement with Jam Handy. We'll be here at least throughout the summer, maybe longer. Ah, now we can just have church. Take a deep breath, gather, sing some songs, hear a good message, do what we do. What Jesus is doing, we're about to read it in a minute here. I'm going to get to the scriptures. But there's a disruption taking place. And this disruption is so cold. It happens, and they don't even recognize it. They don't even see it. Could perhaps Holy Spirit be disrupting some things with us as a people and maybe even with you as an individual? Could it be that the losing of your, the loss of your job is something that God has sovereignly aligned and ordained? Could it be the a relationship that, that seems to be broken, all but done? Could it be that scholarship you thought you were going to get that fell through? Could it be God forcing you to another door, down another path? Like, maybe, maybe not. Again, the point is we must learn to first have the right heart to say all we want is what you want. And then get in a position to hear what he wants. Family, your, your one responsibility, or two, listen and obey. Listen and obey. Now, I don't want to oversimplify it because we do have a problem. The problem is we each come to him with a spiritual disability. Or we can hear with these natural ears. We, we're hard at listening. And the reason we're hard at listening is not because it's not being explained well. It's because of something that has taken place that is at work on the inside of us. So what I want to do in my time I have left, I want to encourage you to look inwardly. Ask the Holy Spirit to show me. Show me me. Show me, me. Listen, baby, I know you've been hurt. I know you've done some things where you don't even want to face yourself. I've been there. I've been there. I don't even, times where I don't even want to walk, look in the mirror. Walk past it quickly so I don't have to face what's deeply on the inside of me that I, thinking that if I don't acknowledge it, maybe it'll go away. 
because time heals all things, right? But time has no healing virtue. Time may cause the senses to numb. Time may cause you to forget some of the details. It may cause you to misremember, but it cannot heal. And only God can do that. So if we're going to deal with this spiritual disability, we've got to face us. We have to look in really. Say, why am I like this? Holy Spirit, lead us. us to be the people that you desire for us to be on the inside out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I was going to apologize for us not having a screen today like Meg did earlier. And I think I want to say sorry, not sorry. I think I want to say sorry, not sorry. <sighs> what I mean by that is what, I've, what I see happening in this text right here, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm, uh, I'm uh, what, do you, what do you call it, uh, I don't want to bury the lead, right, but I, so I'm not doing all the preacher things they tend to do is set up, set this up properly. So this is less of that this morning, <laughs> this is more, you're just trying to be responsive to how Holy Spirit is. Is leading, so I'm gonna step away from my mo my notes just for a minute, just for a minute. Bear with me. But we, as a newer church plant, we fit into this model, so to speak, that I thank God for. I'm very grateful for. However, I also have learned and continue to learn there are certain things that can be very dangerous about the way the contemporary church has done church and has viewed what successful church looks like. What do you view as successful when you think about the church? I be, can, I be, can I be real? I have said, we're not about the crowd of people. We, we want, you know, the cloud, not the crowd. <laughs> and I think when I said those things, I, I meant it. I really do. But if I go back and examine my heart and certain decisions that have been made, I do think that we will be more successful. We'll be, we'll be in a better position to do some of the things that God has called us to do with more people. I think that. I think that if we have more people, we can get more people to help volunteer and sign up for certain areas so that we don't have to burn out our teams. Can we look at our team back there? Look at, look at all of them. Some of them back there, Jocelyn back there. Are y'all good? I see, I see 5 0 back there. Five, okay, 5 0, 5 0, 5 0. Hey, we good. We, we good. Y'all good? Amen. Amen. That's my sister, Amber. I'm just playing. My thinking if we have more people, then maybe we can raise enough money so that we can get a building or we can afford to be mobile, all the things. But my, my mind so easily goes to people meeting needs. And not ultimately God who uses people as he wills to meet those needs. And it's so much more easier for me to shortcut God and go right to people. Go right to people. Family, that is poisonous to us as a spiritual body. I cannot overemphasize this. You are a spirit. We are a spiritual body. So the way we evaluate certain things has to be by the spirit are we producing spiritual fruit not just how how big was the offering today how many people came today honestly if we looked at those things whew, man. <laughs> we'd be really really frustrated and disappointed at God and if I'm honest with you I want to tackle something deeper and then we'll get into this passage. One more question that I've sat with. And I've mentioned this before, and I've had other leaders in this church ask me, why don't we see more people get saved? Like, is that what it's all, it's all about? Like, really, what's the reason for that? 
Is it indicative of the climate that we live in? Is it because we, we tend to create environments here in this room that, that causes people to be very comfortable and relaxed? You have your coffee, you come in, you sit down, you say, what up, though? Is, there, is it possible that maybe that maybe has desensitized them to the spiritual disability that they have? Have we gone overboard in trying to cater to people? Have we somehow bought into this whole seeker-friendly approach to the gospel? Have we done that? Is that us? If you've never heard that phrase before, seeker-friendly, there was a movement some 20, 25, 30 years ago that churches across the country began to sprout up. They were identified, self-identified even as seeker-friendly churches. And the idea was they don't want to just huddle and be on the inside only, but they want to be inviting to those who are quote-unquote on the outside, those who are seekers. So they do away with the Christianese, so to speak, right? And I'm not saying all of this is bad stuff. But I think it's interesting how a few years ago the, the guy who was at the helm of that movement, who was the face of that movement, came out and said, we missed it because we grew crowds. We grew big churches, mega churches even, became very popular. By many, this was looked at in the secular world as the premier church, the biggest church, or the most influential church in the country. They did a great job of growing people, growing crowds, a horrible job at making disciples. So in 2016, a couple years before then, 2014, we began praying about what Detroit Church would look like. We had churches that had that philosophy and that mindset who were part of our management team. And so, and so some of that has kind of is in our DNA. Now, all of those things aren't bad, but we have to be brave enough to ask the question, why are we doing these things? And is it producing the kind of fruit that God has called us to produce? We can do all these things week after week, set up chairs, set up equipment, even when the screens don't work, set up coffee, all these things, right? We can go week after week, month after month, and we can pick our heads up and we look around. Like, do we see fruit? And is it the kind of fruit that God is after? So, my heart has a tinge of heaviness this morning. I don't ever want to come across like I'm okay or want you to be okay with going through the motions, just doing the things, just because we should do the things. Never. We always have to ponder and ask God, Father, where are you? Even if that means in the middle of a service. In the middle of a service. I recognize asking that question, God, where are you? I'm losing probably about 75% of the room. Because we come, we gather with unprepared hearts. Honestly, we probably could have, I know this is gonna sound wrong to a lot of a lot of us, could have, maybe should have spent another 30, 45 minutes in worship. It's not about a song. But what worship does, it breaks up the fallow ground of our hearts. Because of the spiritual disability that we, we have, or in some cases perhaps we've, we've gained, like we've broken up the fallow ground and it's, the fallow ground has gotten hard again, so it needs more work. We gotta do more work on our hearts so that when we gather, we're simply seeing him high and lifted up. And I'm lifting my hands not because it's my favorite song or I give a crap about the style of song that it is. What are we doing? What are we talking about? What? We reduced worship and praise and worship to a genre? Are you us? Us? The church, the people of God? We expect the world to do certain things, y'all. Not us. We have our favorite musicians. We have our favorite worship leaders. We have our favorite preachers. God forbid. So what worship does, it, if, we, if we do it right, and by doing it right, I'm not talking again about what we hear by our audible ears, but preparing our hearts to see him. 
And in that moment, we are seeking him. And we are crying out to him, change me. Open my eyes, God. Open my eyes, because I can't see. Unplug my ears, because I'm struggling hearing right now. But I know it's not you, it's me. But I know that you can do it. You can, you can unplug those ears. You can give me a heart of flesh from a heart of stone. You can create in me a, a clean heart so that I can properly respond to you, God. Listen, if you have a hard time ever connecting in praise and worship, I just gave you the remedy. That's what you pray right then and there. Listen, listen, Americans, Detroiters, we come to the scriptures with a disability because we've been reared since we've been babies that we live in this democratic society where we have a, a say-so, a choice, a voice, and everything, and everything is centered around our level of comfort. That don't work. Hey, listen, Burger King's slogan was, have it, have it your way. <laughs> you see what happened to them. <laughs> okay, maybe there were other reasons why they went out of business. However, this has to be God. What is your, what is your will? Father, have your way. Do work on me. So I can fall in line with your way, not my way. I need your way. Most of the time, if not all the time, my way don't look like your way. I don't enjoy struggling. I don't want to have physical issues in my body. But if, are you in this? Like, what do we, how do we take, how do we wrestle or grapple with the fact that it pleased the Father to smite the Son? That the whole desire for the Father to reconcile us to Him was through a Son who came not on a, a battle horse with a crown like the kings of the past, but a, a king who was a suffering servant. And what Jesus is doing as the crowds gather to Him, He's helping them expose for those that have an ear to hear their own spiritual disabilities because the background, the context that they would have heard his message here in Mark chapter 4 is there's an expectation. There's a messianic expectation that they've built their whole lives around. It's part of their culture for centuries and centuries. And in their minds, the Messiah would come looking like the great King David. However, the Messiah would be someone who was even greater. They were looking for the kingdom of Rome to be overthrown. So how he came. At first, things are looking great. He's healing people. It's a lot of excitement. It's a lot of hype. But then he starts, in their minds, acting crazy, talking crazy. Even his own people. So Detroit Church, we are at a fork in the road. And we must be okay that as we preach the unadulterated gospel of God, as we teach God's word, as we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, whatever he is asking of us, we must be okay that that doesn't grow us numerically. That it actually shrinks us numerically. I think some of us who have livelihoods in, into this, right? I'm a full-time employee of Detroit Church. My brother, Pastor Fonz, full-time employee. We have a couple other part-time employees. What if God says, lay off all the employees? Nobody gets scared, God. Saying I don't think God's saying it. But <laughs> don't get scared. <laughs> don't get scared. I'm sorry. I'm, but, but this has to hit home for us. This ain't about a job. Security. What are we doing? What are we doing? All right, my time before my time runs out, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Get this. Mark has given us this picture of a floating pulpit. In other words, a boat. The crowd is so large. Jesus thinking like a, a carpenter, I would imagine. His mind is engineering mind comes up with the best scenario for 
him to be able to communicate with a large crowd. But I love just the patience and the creativity. So he asked the disciples, we see, he says a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And his teaching, and in his teaching, he said to them, listen, this is, this is quite a demonstrative command, a clarion call, so to speak, that we don't necessarily get in the English translation of this. But he says, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see, get this, get this. So that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when the tribulation of persecution arises on account of the word, Immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Thirtyfold. 60-fold and a hundredfold. The Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. This, again, is a fork in the road in the life and the ministry of Jesus as communicated to us through Mark, Mark's gospel. This is a very important point in time in Jesus' ministry. Did you notice how, I want to be sensitive of time, but also communicate what I feel the Lord wants me to communicate today. But did you notice how when the crowd was gone, you don't have to really tap in because I know we don't have it on the screen, so I pray that you were able to really follow that story along. But did you notice how when the crowd was gone, how Jesus kind of like went into detail after the fact that the crowd was gone? Did you notice that? And did you notice that the question that the, the disciples had once the crowd had left, the question that he had for them? Did you notice that? Now, how many of you are familiar with this story, at least? Vaguely familiar. Okay, so maybe a little more than half a room. Like, I always thought, I assumed even, in a quick reading of this, that the question the disciples had was, can you explain to us the parable? But that's not their question. That's not what they were really were asking for. They needed to ask that, but they didn't ask that, which I think is significant. They wanted to know, why do you speak in parables? They, they had a hard time even understanding Jesus' entire method. 
not just the one story that he told. And this story is so significant. If you don't understand this story, you couldn't understand any of the stories or the parables that Jesus told. I think that for some of us, Sunday school, thank God for Sunday school. How many of y'all used to go to Sunday school growing up? Like, we don't do that anymore. We don't do that necessarily anymore. But I grew up with this idea of parables being just a cool and creative way that Jesus broke it down for people so that they can understand. And in some way, Sunday, that Sunday school experience has done us a disservice because it doesn't present to us this fork in the road or this confrontation and even this judgment that is happening here in this story. And Jesus begins to talk about what I would call their spiritual disabilities. There are two questions we, we see coming out this passage here. One of them is direct and explicit. The other one is indirect and implicit. I got to run through them. The first one, again, we see the disciples asking the question, why does Jesus tell stories? Why does he tell parables without explaining what they meant? The other question is, what's wrong with, what's wrong with this? Why aren't more people getting saved? Why aren't more people following Jesus? One of his disciples, we don't know which one, but they ask him in, 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 in Luke, in Luke's account, like it's why are more people getting saved? Again, this is something I've wrestled with. I've, I've shed tears over. When I examine my own heart, have I done a good job in communicating the word of God and walking with people? And, and we, we don't see not only people getting saved like we desire to see, but also people's lives bearing fruit from the word that is sown. Why does that not happen? What's happening here? As we understand, as I communicated a little while ago, that there is a, there's a background going, taking place here. There's a background that is at work. There's a context that this original first century audience would have had in mind that speaks to the climate that they are hearing Jesus' words in. And the climate, hear this, the climate, ultimately, when it all boils down, is one of unbelief. It's one of unbelief, which is extremely toxic and poisonous to the believer. We have to be careful, family, even in our day and age, to be able to discern, to discern the climate of our culture, the Christian culture, the climate of the church, the climate of the world around us. And so that we aren't judging spiritual things by natural means. We aren't judging how successful we're doing because we have this best practices corporate mindset or marketing mindset that is so common in the world. And when we do that, it puts us in this, this position of fostering this climate of unbelief. So I want to encourage you to constantly be dealing with the culture around you, constantly be evaluating the culture around you. As we dig into the scriptures throughout this series, those of you who are coming Wednesday night in Bible study, as you're sitting in life groups, as we are communicating God's word, encouraging one another, digging into the scriptures, all of those things are vitally important. But I want to encourage us to do that alongside of what we're seeing in the world around us, not just in a vacuum. As the crowd is gathering, it becomes clear to us that Jesus was never interested in the big crowd. I, I, I imagine that this was a shock to them. I imagine that the disciples specifically are almost like, hmm, interesting. Maybe to some extent even disillusioned. But one thing we see is Jesus had their attention. He had met, uh, he hadn't met their expectation, but he had their attention. Get this. They had an expectation of a way the Messiah would come again, right? He had their attention. He did not have their allegiance. Now, to some extent, maybe you can, you can, it can even be argued that allegiance, to some extent, he did have their allegiance. What I mean by that is, if he showed up 
and did the things that he wanted them to do and met their expectation, they would continue to come. But the moment he switched up and did not do the things that he, that they expected him to do, they would, they would switch up to him. And they would leave him. But here's the thing, he was not after their allegiance. You know, you can be committed to something for the wrong reason again. Right? We can, be, we can give something allegiance and, and our hearts not fully be pure in that. So here, as we look at the question here, we see Jesus drawing this line in the sand. He told these stories so that it, the line will be clear. So that those who had hearts who wanted him would hear it and say, yes. Those who heard it, their faith would be stirred. And they would get what they needed to continue following him. And those who came for the wrong reason, those who had their allegiances misplaced, they would see confusion. Eventually they would find judgment. Judgment. Now, who is the sower in this story? Who is the sower in this story? And if, you, if, it, if it doesn't immediately come to mind, that's actually okay. Because the sower really is not the focus of this story. Now, the sower is Jesus in this immediate context. He's the one with the seed who is sowing the seeds, right? Those of us who communicate the scriptures, those of us on a Sunday mornings or Wednesday, we, we communicate the scriptures. But I would say even those of you who are discipling others, like are you discipling anybody? Are you spending time with anybody, sitting down, opening up the Bible, planting seeds of faith? Planting the seeds of the gospel in their hearts. We're the sowers. The sower is not the main focus here. Because Jesus doesn't mention who the sower actually is. The focus here is the soil. The focus here is not even the seed. All right, so again, the sower is the communicator of the word in the immediate context. It's Jesus, right? The seed is the word of the gospel. The gospel message, the word of truth. The sower is who? The seed is who? Then we have four types of soil. Did you catch that? Four types of soil. The first soil is what? Who remembers it? The first soil was the hardened soil. The second soil was the rocky soil. The third soil is the thorny soil. And the fourth soil is what? Say it again. The good soil. Amen. The good soil. All right. Good job listening. I got to reinforce these things with no screen. Sorry. All right, I had some dope slides too, so it's all right, next time. I want to, in my closing minutes here, talk through what these soils represent, what these soils represent. The hardened soil was representative of the seed that had scattered by hand that had inevitably, inevitably fallen on, 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 on the soil that was not prepared to produce what the soil would, what the seed would produce. In other words, it was inevitable with scattering by hand that some of it would be close, some of it would be scattered close to the roads. And the roads presented this kind of soil that was hardened. And they were hardened because there weren't roads like we look at roads today with cars going by, but there were people going by. And the roads had become hardened by the footsteps that, and the heavy traffic. You ever tried to plant something in a garden with, with hardened soil? It's not going to work, right? It, it cannot work. So the, the, the idea that Jesus has given us here was this seed in this type of soil here actually never had a chance. It never had a chance. It's likened to those who would come to the gatherings of believers. Maybe you were invited, but you, you're coming, you're not, you know, you, you're here because it's a cultural thing to do. Again, maybe you were invited, but you, you, you've never really considered what it means to follow Jesus. You've never really contemplated what it means to give him your life. And because this seed has fallen on ground that is, is hardened, it cannot bear anything. It cannot be reprodu reproductive. Jesus says that what would happen is the birds will come and it would be trampled underfoot. We see that in Luke chapter 8 as travelers walked along the path. Is that you today? 
Are you here simply because it's a cultural thing to do to co go to church? And that's a real thing in Detroit, in case those who may not know. If you're here because you were invited, I'm so glad you're here. Listen, we want you to be here. <laughs> what up, though? Welcome. What up, though? Welcome. Right? But it's peace. But it's important that we help you to understand what this is. Oh, Lord, help me. So, if we simply wanted to grow numerically, do you know that there are some very easy things that we could do? Y'all know that? Like, I'm a marketing guy. We got some talented people on the team. We can reroute some of the finances, some of the funds, and get some billboards. We can make sure our sermons are no more than 30 minutes, right? We can, we can cater to a certain kind of crowd who wants you to want to get you in and get you out so you can be about your day. I'm not trying to step on no toes, but maybe I am. There are certain things that we can do to cater to the person who has hardened soil. But I really never has this, this heart to, to follow Jesus. There are certain things that we could do. I wish I had more time to, to, to dig into that. I want to go into the next type of soil. The next type of soil was the rocky soil. And this one was, was tricky because it, 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 on the surface, it looked like it was prepared. It looked like it was good soil. But this kind of soil was perfect for building, but lousy for planting. Lousy for roots to go deep so that it could be effective and so that it could produce. Because if there's no deep, if there are no roots that went deep, then there was no moisture that could allow the plant to be nourished and to grow. The seed that was sown in the rocky ground initially showed, it, showed promise. But soon, the elements, the scorching sun will cause it to wither away. Is that you today? But there are elements in your life, things that have happened around you, things not in you, but things that are external, that have caused you. At first, you were running well. At first, you were excited to come to church. At first, you were all up in life group. You signed up. You want to help with kids. You want to do all the things that the church is asking you to do. But life comes at you at us hard. It has to come at you in a way that it's caused you not to be as fervent, not to hunger and desire God's word, not to, not to long for, for fellowship among the brothers and the sisters in the faith, not to come to men's meetings, life group, 3130, because there's no root. I want to encourage you, if you are here and you, you want to have soil that represents good soil and a heart to be productive in the kingdom of God, you got to be in a place where your roots can go deep so that you can flourish. There's no flourishing without deep roots. That's the second kind of soil, the third kind of soil, thorny soil, thorny soil. This was not external. This was internal. I honestly, I think that thorny and rocky soils represent much of the church today. And I wish I didn't have to say that. But this thorny soil was soil that had been consumed with these native plants that normally had been removed before planting. They were removed before planting, right? The ground seemingly looked good after it was tilled. However, they did not take all of the thorns out. So there were thorns still in the, the ground, in the soil. And as the seed would begin to sprout, a crop of weeds would grow up with the plant. And at some point, even the seeds that were sown in the good soil, the thorny seed would impact the seed sown in good soil if it got too close. Look at this. A thorn is in an undeveloped leaf bud. It's an undeveloped leaf bud that curls inwardly in of itself. And it, it curls within itself to a point where it becomes sharp. And it becomes sharp to the point where if you touch it, 
it's not pleasant. You ever hit a thorn before with your finger? Don't feel good, do it. If you if you if you if you're a novice like me when it comes to gardening and planting, I, I'm learning. But I sometimes I get a little excited and I put my hands in the dirt with no gloves on, thinking I'm, I know what I'm doing and I really don't. And I got the scars <laughs> as proof. Well, thorns are like that. They become so enwrapped in of themselves, they become pointy and they're sharp. And the way we respond to people, when my life is about me and my desires and my purpose and my goals and my success and my kids and my family and all the me things. You ever been around somebody like that? They're often irritated because they're too wrapped up in themselves. And again, even thorny seeds as even good seeds that were planted in good soil, when they got too close to the thorny seeds, they would be affected and consumed with the thorns. Now, you got to watch who your company is. you got to watch who you're allowing to, to get your ear, to have your heart. You have to watch your timelines, your algorithms. Listen, your algorithms need to be developed and curated based upon God's plan for your life. I'm telling you, if you don't, if you don't plan for it, it will plan for you. And it will feed you with all kinds of things. And you'll find yourself like the seed planted in the thorny soil, wrapped up in yourself, wrapped up in your own desires. Me, 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 I, I, I. <sighs> and the last soil we see is the good soil. It's the good soil. This is the soil Unlike the first three that represent the spiritual disabilities, this is the soil that may come limping. It may come with a disability, right? But it has a heart to, to listen. It's soil that has been prepared. It's soil that where the, the fallow ground has been stirred. It's been broken up so that the hand can go in. The thorns have been taken out. Moisture can find its way down deep. When the seed is planted, the roots can go down deep. And for us, that represents believers, those who are following Jesus, who simply have come to him with, with the yes and the amen. Have come to him with the, I'll obey, I'll listen, I'll hear, and I will obey. I want to, if I can share a story, it's kind of how I see uh, this kind of happening a bit in this text here. Then we're going to be done. Is that okay? All right, so follow me. But imagine like two, two friends. You have, a, you have a friend, like a buddy that when something is going on, the first person you think about, whether it's a concert or movie, but something that you want to experience with, with somebody close to you, right? Just imagine that, right? And they're two friends, and one of them asks, hey, yo, have you, have you heard about this, uh, this Jesus dude, bro? So this is 21st, this is first century, not 21st century, okay? First century, Jerusalem, Galilee. And he says, hey, have you heard about this, this Jesus, bro? Dude, he's like, I hear he's like, bro, he is like getting everybody's attention. He is blowing up. And he's gonna be here tomorrow afternoon. I hear he's gonna, he's gonna be on like on this floating pulpit, and it's just gonna be wild. Bro, I heard about him. Bro, I'm, I'm in that joint. Let me know. Let's go. Let's go. Bro, I know, right? He sounds like he's the one that I remember my father talking about. And my grandfather and all his brothers used to sit around. And they would dream that this day would actually come. And here we are. Like, it's, it feels like it's actually, actually here. Like, bro, this is going to be amazing, bro. I'm excited. So don't be late. Bro, this is going to be bigger than Coachella, bro. All our people going to be there. It's going to be wild. Coachella, look, Christella. Christella, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so these two friends, they sat about to go hear this preacher in this floating pulpit. Let's call them Levi and Saul. Levi and Saul. They get on the scene and they're amazed. Christella is popping. All the people, there's an excitement and expectation in the air. Jesus is in the boat, right? They're just excited to hear everything that he has to say. They heard about miracles. 
They have this expectation that there's a new kingdom that's going to be ushered in. A new kingdom. What? Let's go. The crowd is humongous. Jesus doesn't disappoint. He's brilliant. The words that he speaks, the way he has everybody's attention. He's such an independent thinker. Pride of Nazareth. This moment is actually quite overwhelming. And the event is finally over, and everybody's been dispersed, and, and the two friends actually get separated. They get separated. There's no phones, and they can't text each other. Like, where you at, homie? Like, they get separated. And, and Levi is actually on his way out of town on a business trip, and he's going to be gone for a couple of months. So two months later, they're in town in the market, and they run into one another. And, uh, and Levi says, yo, Saul, what's good, homie? My guy, what's good? I haven't seen you since Christ never do. You been good? Bro, Saul says, man, it's been wild, bro. It's, it's, been, it's been crazy right here, a lot of stuff going on, you know. I got cooked up with this, this crew, you know, the scribes, bro. Like, they let me in. What? Yeah, bro. Oh, man, it's going so good. Say, by the way, um, last time I saw you was at Christ Stella. What you think of, what you think of him? Like, I kind of thought it was a bust. I kind of thought, uh, it wasn't all that I thought it was going to be. Levi says, what you mean, man? So I says, so. I guess it just wasn't what I was expecting. You know, I had, you know, I had these high hopes, bro, because this is, this is what we're all about. I'm about the community, man. I'm about the people, man. We got to see change in the streets, in the neighborhoods. And everybody was saying that he was the one that was going like, to work for our cause and, and put us back to where we should be as a people. They said he was the chosen one. They said he was the one that we had been waiting for, bro. And like, I heard the kingdom arrive. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there waiting on the kingdom. That's what the other guy said, right? He says, what? Well, huh? What you mean the other guy? Like, you mean, come on, man. You know the weird guy. The, the dude that was eating the, the roaches. But those are not roaches, bro. Those are locusts, bro. Same thing, bro. You know who I'm talking about. The weird guy with the long hair. John, John the baptizer, right? He said that this was the, the one that we, we could expect, that the kingdom had finally arrived. Well, he said he was the one. He said he was him, bro. I can't tell. I was waiting to hear something that I never heard. I was expecting him to, to give us this, this new city plan, this new kingdom agenda. I was waiting for him to overthrow the Roman government. And bro, like, I'm still waiting, bro. It didn't happen. Honestly, I was just not impressed. You know what I got? I got a Galilean carpenter telling a story, bro, about planting. And it wasn't even a good story. <laughs> bro, that's all I got, bro. I've definitely heard better. He started off like, oh, listen to me, you know. There's a farmer who goes out to sow a seed. I'm like, bro, are you kidding me? I can't even go anywhere. The crowd is huge. I'm stuck listening to him talk about this farmer for hours. <sighs> Enough about me, bro. What do you, you think about this situation? Levi says, bro, my experience, I think, was a bit different from yours. I went to hear a Galilean carpenter tell a story, and I met the Son of God. I went to hear this carpenter who I heard had something to say, and I met the King of glory. And I've been a follower of Jesus ever since that afternoon. Bro, like you know he's Lord and King, right, my guy? Saul says, Lord and King? I don't see it, bro. I don't see it. I don't think that story is too far-fetched from what our room looks like right now. I don't think it's too far-fetched from what our city looks like right now. I'm not talking about those who get up and go to church on a Sunday morning, those who pay their tithes, right? those who follow with all the right... You know, Christian meme accounts on Instagram. I'm talking about those who have counted the cost of what it means to follow him. Have you prepared your heart? Have you dealt with your own spiritual disability? It's not the preacher. It's not the seed that's sown. It's the one with the soil. And the soil is representative of your heart. So my prayer for us today, family, is that we can 
do a better job of breaking up the fallow ground, the hardened ground, the, the soil that has become hardened over time. So that when he speaks, we're not hard of hearing. I hear echoing what I've heard for over a year now. I hear it often, y'all. It's the words of the Holy Spirit in Hebrews chapter 3. It says, the Holy Spirit says, today, today, if you hear his voice, will you harden not your heart? Today, if you hear his voice, will you harden not your heart? Because to not hear his voice is actually an act of judgment. But for those who want to hear it, the Holy Spirit is there. He's speaking. He's speaking. And he's moving. So, Father, our prayer is that you would make us into the people you desire for us to be. That we will be a people of prayer and intercession. That we will be a people of worship. That we will be a people of the word. That we will be a people who are honest and face even the hardened soil in our own hearts. Help us not to be so wrapped in ourselves that we are not doing the proper work on our hearts, God, so that we can properly hear you. Help us not be so wrapped in the world that's happening around us where our roots cannot go deep. Help us not to be so easily distracted by the affairs of this life but help us to value the kingdom expression of your people that you continue to make for yourself. A kingdom of priests, a people of your own possession, that we may declare the excellencies of our king. I pray today, God, that by your spirit, do work on our hearts if you're here today and I want to give it I'm not going to give a normal altar call just for salvation here the Holy Spirit is kind of leading me in a different direction if you are here today and you acknowledge that your heart has been either hardened rocky or thorny I'm going to ask for you to stand up and I'm going to ask for you to stand up just as a, a, a measure of faith and boldness and acknowledgement. This is not about anybody judging you or calling you out. This is between you and God. Father, break up the foul ground in our hearts, God. Break up the foul ground in our hearts, God. I think there's more still. give you a chance to sit down those of you who are standing because this, this cannot be something that is forced upon you this cannot be something that you're coerced and manipulated into but you standing first of all is just acknowledging yeah it's been hard it's been rocky or it's been thorny if your desire in this moment is to have a heart that represents soil that is good soil that is prepared for roots to go deep. Soil that is responsive to the Spirit of God that bears fruit. If that is you, keep standing. If you are struggling with it, if you're ready to have a heart yet or do what it, you need to do to have a heart of good soil, I'm going to give you permission to sit down. I'm going to give you permission to sit down. This is not about the number of people. This is about hearts that are open, naked before him. So you could be new here. You could be on staff here. You could be a, a pastor here. You could be a minister here. This is the responsibility that each of us have to break up the hard and rocky or thorny grounds of our hearts. If you're still standing, maybe you haven't stood yet, but you need to stand. You can still stand. I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. And he's simply, 
symbolic of a heart to surrender to God. To God. Father, we don't want to be surrendered to religious systems. We don't want to surrender, Father, to our jobs, to our careers, to our own selfish desires, Father. We don't want to be surrendered, God, to the deception of the age. We don't want to be surrendered, Father, to identity crises. We don't want to be surrendered, Father, to our own misplaced desires and, and hunger for the world. We don't want to be surrendered to the deceitfulness of riches and wealth, God. We don't want to be surrendered, Father, to carnal relationships that draw us away from you instead of closer to you. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Give us an ear to hear your spirit. Will you unplug our ears, Father? Father, do surgery on our hearts where the hardened ground is softened. We need you. Father, we need you. We acknowledge our need for you. We acknowledge our desperation for you, Father. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Make us new. Make us new. Family, be encouraged, please, by this. As we do the work on the inside of us, and He prepares our, the soil of our hearts. Do you know the responsibility, the work, the pressure? There's no pressure, but it's on Him. So as someone has prepared the soil of their hearts, now what God does, he puts a seed in you. And now you have the responsibility of continuing to sow that seed in others. And when you do it, you'll see fruit, not because you've presented it the best way, not because you've memorized a lot of scripture, not because you've done everything just right, but because you are surrendered to him. I get this. But Jesus promises us, he says, you will see a return of some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. What? Do you know to their first century minds that would have been ludicrous in that specific climate? Again, climate impacts soil. Climate determines soil. In that region, they normally would get like an eight-fold return. The farmers would get, a, in, in a good year, the farmers would get an eight-fold return. Did you hear that? Jesus says some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. Now what that also tells us is that the way God is going to use us is not uniform. We don't get to decide. That's not on us. The results are not on us. The responsibility to hear, to listen, to obey by product of a prepared soil, prepared heart. He will make sure that the results that he's after are seen. This is what he promises us. Isaiah 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I have sent it. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. At this time, going to partake of the Lord's table. This is an opportunity for those who have placed faith in Christ, been engrafted into the body of Christ by grace. It's God's doing. If you're here, maybe you haven't made that decision yet. You have an opportunity still now to do that, to place faith in him. I pray that your faith has been stirred here in this word. 
faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you can do that. Simply acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner in need of a savior. Acknowledge that God has sent his son Jesus to earth to die on your behalf, to reconcile you back to him. If you can pray that simple prayer, receive him, acknowledge his lordship, then what we're about to do is for you as well. I'm going to ask Meg and Jake to come up.